what would you do if you were somehow both human and superhuman? What if you could see through walls, dodge bullets, and bend steel with your bare hands, but still lose your life with one false move? Would it make a difference if the city you called home was well on its way to hell in a handbasket? These are the questions you'll answer in Cyberpunk 2077 the latest open-world role-playing experience from CD Projekt Red that's set to release on September 17th. But what about the game itself? How big will it be? How much freedom will you have? And what will combat be like? After poring over dozens of articles, interviews, and reports, these are just some of the questions I answer in my Ultimate Preview. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing and stick around till the end of the video for a special $100 giveaway. But for now, I hope you'll join me as I look at everything we know about the world and the gameplay of Cyberpunk 2077. In Cyberpunk 2077, you'll explore Night City, a fictional California metropolis where gangs run the streets, mega corporations pull the strings, and where cybernetic body modification has become the norm. It's a place that CDPR has called, quote, the most believable city in any open world game to date. It's divided into six districts, and so far we've gotten a close look at two. The first, called Watson, was seen in the gameplay demo shown at E3 2018. It's a former industrial district that's now dominated by what CDPR calls mega buildings, massive structures that house entire micro societies of densely packed apartments, shops, and NPCs. Watson is also infested with crime, and it happens to be where the game's protagonist, a mercenary named V, calls home. In the gameplay demo revealed after Gamescom in 2019, we got to see another district called Pacifica, which is the most dangerous area in all of Night City. Originally intended as a luxurious tourist destination, the project was abandoned amidst an economic crisis. Now its streets are lined with empty buildings and populated by Haitians who emigrated to Night City in the 2060s after Haiti suffered massive floods due to climate change. This is just one example of how every last detail in this world, from the neighborhoods to the people, will have a backstory and a reason for existing. Other districts we know to be in the game but that haven't been explicitly shown include the city center, where you'll explore gigantic corporate buildings and which sounds like one of the safer areas due to heavy corporate security and its high concentration of wealth. Then there's Westbrook, another wealthy borough where you'll explore Japantown, and lastly, there's Haywood, a massive housing district, and Santo Domingo, where you'll find all of the city's power plants. Not only is each district designed to look unique, but they actually respond differently to your actions. For example, what if you commit a crime? Speaking to US Gamer at Gamescom 2019, Cyberpunk 2077 producer Richard Borzamowski explained how the repercussions will vary depending on your location. Quote, in Pacifica, one of the poorer areas, you could probably shoot someone and if nobody would see, then nobody would care. If you would do that in the city center, you would probably get some law enforcement because those areas are way more patrolled. End quote. Your ability to commit crime also speaks to the amount of freedom you'll have in this world. At E3 2019, Cyberpunk Quest director Mateusz Tomaskiewicz confirmed that similar to Grand Theft Auto, you'll be able to steal any car in the game, as well as shoot pedestrians and non-story related NPCs. You can even run them over or even ram into large crowds. But if you get caught, Borzamowski made it clear that you're better off making a run for it. Quote, your options are to run away, fight them and run away, or fight them, fight them, fight them, and then die. End quote. Even if no police are around, we know that the game's gangs, which I'll talk about in a moment, might also dish out their own brand of vigilante justice should you cause trouble on their turf. In other words, you're free to push this world around, but the world will push back. That said, there is an area within this game that's well-suited for players who aren't a fan of, well, consequences. 
Beyond the city limits are the Badlands, a lawless wasteland forsaken by everyone except scavengers and nomads, where you can explore dusty ruins and race along abandoned highways. So those are the areas you'll explore, but just how big will this world be? Comparisons to The Witcher 3 are inevitable, but if you're expecting Night City's map to surpass The Witcher, at least in terms of square mileage, you might be disappointed. Borzymowski said of the map, quote, if you look at pure surface, right, square meters on the surface or square kilometers, then Cyberpunk might even be a little smaller than The Witcher, end quote. But that doesn't mean it'll feature less content. First off, Cyberpunk is way more densely populated than The Witcher, so it seems reasonable to expect more quests packed closer together. Plus, the city is way more vertical. While you won't be able to enter every building in the game, CDPR did say in a response to a question on their official Facebook page that, quote, Night City has lots of buildings and these buildings have floors. In a tall building, and we will have many of them explorable, each floor can house a lot of activities, end quote. And that's not to mention that the map has also been confirmed to feature multiple underground environments, giving the world even more depth. However big the map ends up being, the game will feature no loading screens and there will be a fast travel option. Even so, the preferred method of travel will likely be your wheels. The game will feature both cars and motorcycles, and we know that at least the cars will come in a range of different classes. You'll have utilitarian vehicles that are designed to get stuff done, luxury vehicles that are built for comfort and style, and armored vehicles that are good for vehicular combat. Unlike the rest of the game, driving gives you the option to switch between first person and third person. But what I think is perhaps the coolest feature of the cars in Cyberpunk 2077 is that they'll each have an AI that enables you to call any vehicle from anywhere right to your location. In that sense, cars in Cyberpunk are similar to Roach from The Witcher, but with more, wait for it, horsepower. Unlike Roach, your car will have a radio with multiple stations that you can switch between. And one last thing about vehicles is that there will be flying cars in Night City, but don't expect to fly around on your own. The devs have said you'll only be an occasional passenger in these vehicles during specific story beats. Regardless of how you get around, CDPR have said that all areas on the map will be available to explore from the very beginning of the game. That said, you'll likely want to avoid certain areas until you've progressed through the story and leveled up to match the enemies you'll encounter. I also want to mention that we haven't actually seen the map of Night City unless you count the subway map. Surely the map you use to mark quests and find your way around will look a lot different. One thing we have gotten a glimpse of is the day-night cycle, and it will impact gameplay. For example, certain quests will require for you to show up at a specific time, and some missions, like those that require stealth, might be easier to pull off at night. You'll also experience a fully dynamic weather system featuring the official weather of the future, Acid Rain. However, I have not been able to find out how or even if Acid Rain will affect gameplay. But weather and time of day are just tiny aspects of what give Night City its texture and depth. It's the people that make it feel like a living, breathing metropolis. For starters, the crowd and community systems have been enhanced from those used in The Witcher 3. You'll see dozens of NPCs on your screen at any given time, and they'll all be going about their day in realistic ways. And then there's the spider web of factions you'll encounter throughout the world. Let's start by looking at the three gangs we've seen thus far. First are the Maelstromers, known for taking body modification to the extreme. As we'll get to later, body mods in Cyberpunk 2077 are called cyberware, and if you're wondering just how much cyberware the human body can handle before breaking down, well, take a look. And FYI, when it comes time to install your own cyberware, CDPR have said you won't be able to take things quite as far as these guys. Next are the Voodoo Boys, who lay claim to Pacifica and happen to be the best hackers in all of Night City. Lastly are the Animals, who are at odds with the Voodoo Boys and who go to great lengths to enhance their physical strength through juicing, working out, and installing cyberware. If you find yourself in a scuffle with the Animals, you better have some big guns or be a damn good melee fighter. They're also skilled in business, which helps them profit from the drug trade and illegal prize fights. But gangs aren't the only factions in Night City. There are also the far more powerful corporations. 
Here in the 2018 gameplay demo, V dealt directly with Militech, a massive weapons manufacturer and private military contractor. We also know that a corrupt and incredibly powerful financial firm called Arasaka will play a role in the game, as will a private space travel company called Orbital Air. Another organization that might affect gameplay in a particularly unique way is a medical insurance company called Trauma Team International. In an interview with WCCF Tech, then UI coordinator on Cyberpunk 2077 Alvin Liu described Trauma Team International as a sort of ambulance that will quote, come in and help save you as long as you have their coverage plan. You're then taken off to a medical facility, end quote. So will you have to buy insurance in Cyberpunk if you want to avoid being left for dead? That would be interesting. The final faction of Night City I want to cover is Netwatch, which exists to police the world's AIs and hackers, which by the way are also known as Netrunners. In this scene here, you have the opportunity to either side with Netwatch or hack into their systems yourself. You decide on the latter and it doesn't go so well. This is a good time to mention that while you'll be able to form alliances with certain gangs and organizations during specific missions, you won't be able to ever permanently join any gang, faction, or corporation. Getting back to Netwatch, one of their goals is to protect people from one of the more mysterious areas within cyberpunk called cyberspace. Cyberspace is a virtual expanse that you can visit, if you dare, by tapping in through a neural interface. According to CDPR, it's not only filled with malicious AIs, but nobody knows what happens there because nobody has ever come back alive, Netrunner or otherwise. That said, you'll likely be the first because V will go there as part of the game's story. And speaking of story, we don't know much, but there is one character who we know will be with you throughout the entire story, and that's Johnny Silverhand, played by none other than Keanu Reeves. Silverhand is an anti-corporate rock star who died many years prior and now exists in V's mind as a quote, digital ghost, thanks to a chip that's been installed in your head. As for how Silverhand factors into gameplay, Tomaskowitz said in an interview at E3 2019 that you'll quote, interact with him throughout the majority of the game and a lot of the plot revolves around him. He has a complicated relationship with V and you can form this relationship in different ways based on how you play throughout the game, end quote. So it sounds like you'll be interacting with Silverhand's character quite a bit. But what about your character? Who will you be? Well, that's entirely up to you. Again, comparisons between Cyberpunk 2077 and The Witcher 3 are inevitable, but one major difference is how your character comes together. Whereas The Witcher 3 was based on an already established protagonist, Cyberpunk lets you decide who you want to be, and much of what you do in the game will be influenced by the decisions you make in the character creation process. One of the first things you do is select your backstory. You'll have three options, and depending on which you choose, your character will start the game with different equipment, and you'll start in an entirely different location within Night City. Of course, each backstory eventually winds up on the same main path, but they each basically act as their own prologue to the game. First is the Nomad. Nomads roam the badlands of Night City, and they value freedom and independence over everything else. Then there are street kids who grew up in the underbelly of Night City and have survived by flexing their physical and technical strength. Lastly are corpos who more or less have a degree in corporate corruption. They know how companies work and how to weaponize information to get ahead and destroy their adversaries. Each backstory will also unlock specific dialogue options that only make sense for a person with that specific background. And it was confirmed on a Cyberpunk Community podcast by Powell Sasko, lead quest designer on Cyberpunk 2077, that these options will not only affect specific conversations, but they can even change how entire quests unfold. Once you've chosen your background, you can customize the look of your character, and for starters, Cyberpunk doesn't ask you to decide between male and female. Rather, you have access to the full spectrum of body types, and from there you can change a multitude of physical features. If you don't already know, it might come as a surprise that you actually don't select a class when making your character. You instead choose your class during gameplay through what the developers call a fluid class system, which I'll cover in detail later in this video. Your job during the creation process is instead to determine how effective your character will be at using certain skills that appeal to you. To do that, you'll assign attribute points to specific attributes related to those skills. 
The attributes available to you are body, intelligence, reflexes, technical, and cool. I'm making some assumptions here, but it appears that the more points you pour into one single attribute, the more proficient you'll become at using its associated skills. Let's go down the list and bear in mind that while some skills are self-explanatory, others haven't been explained at all. First is your body attribute, which is associated with four skills, melee, athletics, two-handed, and shotguns. Next is your intelligence attribute, which is associated with just one skill, hacking. Your reflexes attribute affects your proficiency with handguns, rifles, and blades, while your technical attribute increases your engineering skill, and lastly, the attribute ambiguously titled cool impacts your nerve skill as well as your ability to use sniper rifles and perform assassinations. One note is that your cool attribute has nothing to do with how cool you look, but rather how well you perform under pressure in both combat and conversation. Now, you might be asking, what are all those squares at the end of each skill? Those are perks, and similar to attribute points, you can assign perk points, which will unlock gameplay enhancements related to the associated skill. For example, your athletic skill lets you carry and hide dead bodies to conceal your presence. And by assigning points to a specific perk, you can unlock the ability to run while carrying bodies instead of merely walk. I don't know whether you'll get to distribute perk points at the outset of the game, but you'll no doubt earn them as you make your way through the world. And it's of course in that world where you'll learn the different RPG mechanics and gameplay systems that will no doubt make Cyberpunk 2077 one of the deepest and most engaging games of the year. Let's take a look. When Cyberpunk 2077 was first revealed, many gamers asked, would it be more of a first-person shooter than a true RPG? In a word, no. As put by Sasko, Cyberpunk is quote, first and foremost an RPG where you play as V, a mercenary on the streets of Night City, a character that you can fully customize, picking life paths, picking skills and weapons, customizing the body of the character and living the life in Night City, end quote. So let's look at the gameplay and storytelling systems that make this a true role-playing experience, starting with the branching story and quest lines. Going back to the scene with Militech, it's here that V meets with a Militech executive to arrange the acquisition of a piece of equipment from a rival gang. Right away, the dialogue options present your first choice. You can either lie or tell the truth, but you've been hacked through your neural socket and the enemy can tell if you're being dishonest. That said, you still have options, and if you play your cards right, you'll get a boatload of cash to buy the requested merchandise. From there, you can either pocket the money for yourself or use it as requested. Steal it, and you'll have to acquire the equipment from the rival gang by force. Use the money as planned, and you'll be able to deal with them diplomatically. And that's just one fraction of the choices you can make in one mission. What about the decisions that affect the broader story? We saw how this could play out after you defeat a boss by the name of Sasquatch. After you fight her, CDPR says you can either take or spare her life. So, say you let her go. Will she seek out revenge later on, or will she remember your show of mercy and become an ally? It sounds like these are the consequences you'll be forced to consider throughout the game. As explained by Philip Weber, senior quest designer on Cyberpunk 2077, quote, anything you do could possibly have an impact on the main story of the game. Characters you only meet in a side quest would then suddenly show up in the main story. This way, the player never knows what to expect. Sometimes a small quest can turn into something much bigger and then change the whole main story of the game." End quote. One example we've actually seen of how actions can affect future events is this specific firefight. CDPR confirmed that this is a quote, random encounter, but these are the same bad guys you busted up earlier in the demo and they're now seeking revenge. The implication being that while there's no telling when an ambush like this might occur, it wouldn't have happened had you not taken on the prior mission. What makes all these branching paths even more impressive is that from the sound of it, Cyberpunk's missions will feature no dead ends. That is to say, you'll never get game over because you decided to do things your own way. Going back to the Sasquatch example, say you spare the life of a marked target during an assassination quest. The story will change, but you won't be asked to replay the mission. And speaking of missions, where will you find them? Well, that's where fixers come in. 
Fixers are the quest givers in Night City, and when you meet one, such as Dexter Deshawn, who we're talking to here, you'll gain access to main quests, side quests, and a third type of quest called Street Stories. From what I can tell, each will appear on your map, with main quests and side quests typically providing longer experiences, and street stories providing smaller, bite-sized bits of gameplay, perhaps unrelated to the main quest line. We've no idea how many main or side quests the game will feature, but in an interview with On MSFT, the head of CDPR's Krakow studio, John Mamais, said the game will have around 75 street stories and they'll serve as a way to explore the world and gain experience, of which Cyberpunk has two types. First is traditional XP, which you'll use to level up and presumably earn attribute points and perk points. The second form of experience is called street cred, which boosts your reputation in the world itself and unlocks new and better side missions, new cyberware upgrades, and new vendors throughout the world. Basically, the more street cred you earn, the more content you unlock. That said, boosting your street cred can have a downside. As outlined by Tamaskowitz, quote, the more recognizable you are, that actually might be a detriment in some missions. People will recognize you, and that's not always a good thing if you want to stay incognito. As for how you'll earn traditional XP and street cred, you'll earn both types no matter what sort of mission you're working through, but you'll earn more street cred for completing street stories and more core experience for completing story missions. Of course, as you gain experience, you'll no doubt want to upgrade more than just your skills and your attributes. You'll also want to upgrade your body. As mentioned before, the cybernetic upgrades you acquire in Night City are called cyberware and they're core to your character's customization. Now, most of your cyberware upgrades will be up to you, but two are installed automatically near the beginning of the game. First is an optical implant called the Kuroshi Optical Scanner that not only acts as your HUD, but also lets you zoom in on your surroundings as well as investigate items and vehicles, detect hazards, and size up enemies. It'll even translate languages spoken by non-English speaking NPCs. And I'm also guessing it's your implant that allows you to scan and learn about certain items using the inspection system seen here. In fact, the devs have said that many missions will require some detective work and the Kuroshi implant will no doubt help. Also, the scanner will provide some seriously cool combat abilities, but I have an entire section devoted to combat, so I'll talk about that a bit later. Finally, if you like your optical abilities but not the HUD itself, Cyberpunk will feature a quote, hardcore difficulty setting that will eliminate the HUD entirely. The second piece of cyberware that's installed early on is the subdermal weapons grip which feeds data such as ammo type, ammo capacity, and firing mode directly from your hand to your hut. It also lets you use certain weapons that were previously locked, and it can increase the damage done by melee weapons. Now that's handy. Once you get further into the story, that's when things get really fun, with the opportunity to replace your arms and legs with cyberware, not to mention install chest and even spinal implants. You'll gain abilities like ripping open locked doors and performing a handy double jump, but again, I cover most of these abilities when I dive into stealth and combat. For now, just know that when it comes to character customization, Cyberware is CDPR's trump card. It basically gave the developers license to give V all sorts of superhuman abilities that are believable because they fit logically within the world they've created. One last thing about Cyberware is that, according to Sasco, you'll be able to upgrade each implant by installing particular items called shards. For example, one shard Sasco mentioned makes your cyber legs quieter and hence more effective for stealth. So how might you acquire Cyberware? Well, you'll have to visit specialized vendors who are actually more like surgeons, and they're called Ripper Docs. They'll install your cyberware for a price, and while some Ripper Docs run a legitimate business, others operate within the black market and can install illegal, quote, military-grade cyberware. It's a fair bet that you'll spend a lot of money at Ripper Docs, but there are plenty of other things to spend your cash on in Night City, from items to weapons to clothing and even vehicles. Based on the gameplay demo and several interviews given by the developers, it seems likely that you'll earn most of your money by completing missions, and that you might even be able to accumulate some level of wealth throughout the story. That said, one thing you might not be able to purchase is a new apartment. In 2018, CDPR said on their Facebook page that you would be able to purchase new apartments, but later in June 2019, Cyberpunk art director Cassia Redisuk said, quote, V will only have one apartment and stay there, end quote. This, of course, came as a disappointment to those looking to expand their real estate empire in Night City. However, the apartment you do have seems well-equipped. 
You'll have a weapons locker where you can store guns and melee weapons such as katanas. You'll also have a closet where you'll be able to keep certain outfits. And by the way, different articles of clothing will provide stat boosts and feature special abilities. For example, this jacket increases your resistance to certain attacks and boosts your street cred. Getting back to your apartment, your digs will also feature a garage where you can store the cars you acquire throughout the game. But of course, most of Cyberpunk will be spent outside your apartment, and as with many RPGs, the game's larger world has plenty of extracurricular activities, including some mini-games. The three we've heard about are street races, which are pretty self-explanatory, boxing matches where you'll fight boxing robots similar to what we've seen in the gameplay demos, and finally, there'll be a shooting range where you can test out weapons and practice your aim. But you may have heard there's another extracurricular activity in Night City that a lot more people are looking forward to. Romance. In a Twitter exchange with a community member posted to Reddit, Sasko confirmed that similar to The Witcher, there will be relationship options that involve entire plot lines. But you'll also be able to have one night stands and even pay for sex if that's your thing. And unlike The Witcher, it sounds like Cyberpunk's romance options will account for whether your character is straight, gay, or somewhere in between. Lastly, there are two more systems in Cyberpunk that I want to talk about. First is the loot system. In addition to essential loot that's tied to the story and certain quests, the random loot you'll find throughout each area actually won't be random at all. Instead, to make the world as believable as possible, all loot will be contextual, meaning items you find will make sense given your location. In other words, you won't be finding hand grenades lying around if you're working your way through an office building. As for the crafting system, we learned via a DM exchange between CDPR's Twitter account and another community member that in order to craft, you'll need to, quote, invest in the right perks, and that you'll be able to, quote, craft multiple items including armor, shards for cyberware, weapon modules, special weapons, consumables, and gadgets, end quote. Based on a separate QA with CDPR, we actually learned that the only items you won't be able to craft are clothing and actual cyberware implants. And with that, we've looked at most of the mechanics and systems that aim to make Cyberpunk a deep and engaging role-playing experience. But there's actually one more system I've not covered in great detail, and that's the class system, which lets you decide not just between one of three playstyles, but any combination thereof. I mentioned previously that Cyberpunk 2077 never requires you to select a specific character class. In place of a rigid class system that permanently pigeonholes you into one build, the game features what the developers call a fluid class system. It features three distinct playstyles, one focused on fighting, called a solo, another focused on hacking, called a netrunner, and another focused on engineering, called a techie. I'm doing a little guesswork here, but it appears that of the attributes and skills that you allocate points towards in the character creation process, each one favors one of these three playstyles, and according to a Game Informer article, the more you use a specific skill, the more it will level up. In other words, the skills you use most determine the class or combination of classes you become. Still with me? Good. Let's now look at each class. First is the Solo class. This is for players who want to approach combat head-on, and it's actually broken into two subclasses. You've got the Strong Solo, who enhances their physical strength largely through the use of cyberware. Remember those arms that can bust open locked doors? They're actually called Gorilla Arms, and they're exactly the type of physical augment that suits a Strong Solo player. The other build within the Solo class is the Fast Solo, who are also combat-focused, but instead of maximizing their physical strength, they focus on increasing their speed. If maneuvers like the double jump and dodging bullets sounds like your idea of fun, and you might like to partake in some ninja-esque melee combat, consider the fast solo build. Next, you might be asking, where's all the hacking? Well, that's where the Netrunner class comes in. Netrunners lack the physical prowess of solos, but they make up for it with their aptitude for hacking not just environments, but also enemies. We'll get into exactly how that works in a bit, but just know that if you want to hack an enemy's cyberware to make them, say, blow their own brains out, well, that's just the beginning. Netrunners are also better suited for stealth, and they have access to what's called a nanowire, a red-hot cable that lets you access points from a distance and slice enemies in half. 
The last class you can work towards is the techie. Like Netrunners, techies are more likely to use stealth, but rather than manipulating technology from the inside, they have an aptitude for re-engineering hardware from the outside. Say you need to physically rewire a circuit board to activate an elevator. That's the sort of thing techies can do. But perhaps most tantalizing is that upgrading your techie skills will give you access to an autonomous spider bot named Flathead. Flathead can literally become something of a cyber pet that follows you around, which you can then send to scavenge for parts, tweak the environment, engage enemies, and generally do things that might initially be out of reach. You can even upgrade Flathead to learn new abilities throughout the game. So those are the three classes, but again, you're never pigeonholed into just one. While you're free to pour all of your ability and perk points into one playstyle, you can also develop a hybrid combination of any of the three. As Tomaskowitz put it in Game Informer, quote, you don't have to specialize in one skill. You can be a hacker and also use the katana, or you can use heavy guns, but also be a techie, end quote. Plus, it sounds like you'll be able to respec your character so you won't be stuck if you don't like the way your build is coming along. One final thing people have asked about regarding playstyles is a morality system. While there are many decisions to make in Cyberpunk and many ways the world reacts to those decisions, there is no system that keeps track of whether you're good or bad. In a Q&A on CDPR's official Tumblr account, Weber said that it wouldn't make sense for V to be entirely bad, and considering how tough Night City can be, it also wouldn't make sense to be a pacifist. Given the grim nature of this world, conflict is inevitable. Even die-hard netrunners won't be able to avoid combat altogether, so let's look at what it'll be like to fight in the year 2077. As I've already hinted, Cyberpunk will feature plenty of tools and abilities that will make you a more efficient killer, and it all starts with your Kuroshi Optical Scanner. By sizing up enemies, vehicles, and other parts of your environment, you'll be able to obtain information that might give you the upper hand, such as enemy weak points and whether a vehicle has armor. But it's in the heat of battle where things get really cool. First, you can actually see enemies through walls, but my personal favorite is the Ricochet ability. The devs have said that once you've installed the appropriate, quote, weapon module, you'll then be able to see the path bullets will take as they bounce off walls. This will let you land headshots even on enemies who are taking cover. My second favorite combat ability, which has nothing to do with your scanner and is for some reason called Kereznikov, lets you heighten your reflexes and slow down time. Basically, it's bullet time, and you activate it by using an inhaler called a reflex booster, or as we learned from Weber at E3 2019, through certain cyberware augments, perhaps a spinal implant. Additionally, CDPR has said that drug use is a big part of this world, and that other inhalers, not to mention other cyberware implants, will offer different drug or stimulant-induced abilities, such as healing. The cyber arms that we've already seen several times will also have obvious combat advantages. You can also use them to rip turrets right from their casing, which can then be used as your own personal machine cannon. As you'd expect, Gorilla Arms also allow you to hit harder in combat, and we've seen V grab and use enemies as human shields. But it's not clear whether that specific ability will require Gorilla Arms, or if it's provided via a skill perk upgrade. The game will also feature cyber legs, letting you jump off walls, as well as perform a double jump, a dodge maneuver, and, according to the CDPR Tumblr page, a more powerful charge jump. Of course, these abilities will be useful for both combat and exploring your environment. And speaking of your environment, the game will also feature a cover system, but unlike, say, Deus Ex or Gears of War, the cover isn't sticky. You'll have to approach and duck behind walls and other obstructions manually. But when you are behind cover, aiming down sights will automatically direct your view over or around whatever object you're behind. Getting back to cyberware, one implant that's great for combat that I haven't yet mentioned are mantis blades. These are basically giant daggers installed on your forearms that you can pop out like switch blades, then use to dismember and decapitate opponents. It's important to mention about these abilities that it looks like your adversaries will be able to use at least some of them as well. For example, remember how the Kereznikov ability can slow down time? It's been confirmed that enemies will be able to use the same ability which you'll perceive as them moving very quickly. Something else we haven't seen but that has been mentioned more than a few times by CDPR are katanas. 
As reported by VGR.com, a katana was used in the Behind Closed Doors demo at E3 2018, and it apparently emitted a magnetic field that could be used to deflect bullets. Now that sounds awesome. Other, more basic melee options include knives, broken bottles, and hammers, of which you can throw or use at close range. But of course, there will also be a lot of guns in Cyberpunk 2077, and they come in three flavors. First are power guns. The descriptions CDPR have given are pretty vague, but they sound like your most traditional weapons in the game. One thing we do know is that power guns will have the ability to charge up before you fire. Next are tech guns, which can fire through walls. Remember how your optical scanner can see through walls? Yeah, that's uh, not a bad combo. Tech weapons will also feature alternate firing modes. Some examples that CDPR have talked about include a gun that accelerates its rate of fire the longer you hold down the trigger, and a gun that fires superheated bullets that can melt through enemy cyberware. Oh, and while we're on the topic of guns that can pierce walls, it looks like environments in Night City will be at least partially destructible, making for even more dynamic firefights. Lastly are smart guns. One of CDPR's goals was to create combat that was challenging for experienced shooter fans, but also accessible to gamers who don't play many shooters at all. Enter smart guns, which will fire homing bullets. If you just want to hold down the trigger without aiming down sights, or well, aiming at all, these are the guns for you. One last gun we've heard described by CDPR is an eight-barreled shotgun that can fire all eight shells at once, but we don't know if it's a power weapon or a tech weapon. As for acquiring these guns, you'll obviously be able to loot them off your cold, dead enemies, but Night City will also feature merchants called gunsmiths. And if you've got a gun you already like, but you just want to make it better, you'll be able to attach certain weapon modules like the aforementioned module that enables the ricochet ability, and you can purchase or craft attachments like silencers and scopes. And speaking of scopes, yes, sniper rifles will be in the game. But weapon customization goes beyond mere attachments. For example, according to Sasco, you'll be able to quote, boost up the stats of your weapon of choice, and according to an official CDPR Twitter post, we learned that the more you use a specific weapon, the more efficient V's animations will become as she, for example, reloads or aims down sights. And finally, if all you want is to make your weapon look cooler, there will be custom paint jobs. So that mostly covers combat and weaponry in Cyberpunk 2077, but there is one final weapon that's definitely different from all the others. Remember the nanowire I mentioned earlier? Not only can it hack access points, but it's essentially a razor-sharp laser whip that you can also use to slice your opponents from head to toe. So yeah, don't think that Netrunners can't also be lethal killing machines. And speaking of Netrunners, that brings me to the last two elements of gameplay that I want to examine. For those of you who don't gravitate towards either the strong or fast solo character builds, stealth, hacking, and manipulating technology through an implant called your Cyberdeck will likely be a much bigger part of your experience. Using what are called quick hacks, experienced netrunners will be able to hack devices, systems, and other parts of the environment, and they'll even be able to hack enemies themselves. But to do so first requires that you plug into the network those devices and enemies are connected to. As CDPR puts it, quote, In the world of cyberpunk, once you're jacked into a network, you have access to everything it connects to, end quote. Based on all the research I've done, here's my best summary for how hacking will work. First, you need to find an access point. Once you're plugged in, you then see the interface for the hacking minigame, during which you're given a set of codes that you need to select in order to achieve your main hacking objective. In this scene, your main objective is to gain basic access to the network, and to achieve it, you have to select codes 1C and BD. To the right are a series of secondary codes that unlock certain quick hacks, such as hacking the camera log, which Weber seemed to confirm will let you shut down cameras or access their viewpoints. The other code, labeled Officer Tracing, is more of a mystery. Perhaps it gives you the location of enemies on your minimap. Basically, it looks like the more proficient you are at entering these codes, the more control you gain over your environment. Other quick hacks we've seen include forcing a vending machine to distract some nearby enemy gangsters, causing a weight bench to kill a lifter by dropping a ton of weight on his neck, and here we see V hack a training bot, forcing it to punch with lethal force. You can even see a description of what will happen before you execute a quick hack. 
And as I've mentioned several times, you can also hack enemy cyberware, making them, for example, pull the pin on their own grenade or shoot themselves in the face. Now, it appears that wirelessly performing quick hacks might always require that you first access a network, but I wonder if using the nanowire removes the need to hack the network first by instead making a direct connection. In any case, the nanowire looks like a ton of fun. Now, say you do want to hack a network, but you can't find a traditional access point. It looks like, based on the E3 2018 demo, you might be able to connect to enemy networks directly through the enemies themselves. By jacking into this enemy's neural socket, V gains access to a gang's personnel network, unlocking a quick hack that lets her lock their weapons, preventing them from firing when ambushed. Also, be aware that V herself can get hacked. We saw that earlier when Militech compromised you with lie detecting software, and here we see Sasquatch install a virus that glitches out your optical scanner. Finally, I want to talk about stealth, which is a huge part of gameplay in Cyberpunk 2077. One particularly cool way to stay hidden is with your Mantis Blades. They're not only great weapons, but they allow you to latch onto walls so you can stay above your enemy's line of sight and stay in the shadows. Even environments themselves will enable stealth by offering multiple ways through. For example, here V could hack her way through the front door, but she instead uses her techie skills to rewire this maintenance panel, which grants her a much stealthier entrance. Even Flathead will be useful for stealthy players in ways that remind me of the Hitman games. For example, if you see a lamp or chandelier hanging from the ceiling, you'll be able to send Flathead up to loosen some screws, causing it to drop down, crushing the enemies below. When you take into account all the skill sets in Cyberpunk from rewiring panels and using Flathead to do your bidding, to hacking enemies and devices from a distance, it's easy to see how Cyberpunk 2077 will let just about any player keep a low profile. Even solo players will have stealthy tactics, such as the athletic skill which lets you carry bodies and hide them in trash bins. In fact, CDPR have said that no matter what your build, any character class can complete Cyberpunk without killing a single enemy. To help with this, virtually every weapon has an option for taking out enemies using non-lethal force. Can you say Pistol Whip? Granted, going 100% non-lethal will make your playthrough much more difficult, but surely many ambitious players will want to give it a shot. As many gameplay options that will be available when Cyberpunk releases, there are a few options outside of gameplay that won't be there on day one. First is multiplayer. Since CDPR is known for single-player experiences, this shouldn't be much of a shock, but what might come as a surprise is that the multiplayer component of Cyberpunk isn't going to be an add-on or an expansion to the existing game. It's instead going to be its own separate AAA release, and unfortunately it's not coming until 2022. One thing we'll hopefully get before then are the game's planned single-player expansions, which CDPR recently confirmed will be at least equivalent in terms of size and scale to The Witcher 3's expansions, Hearts of Stone and Blood and Wine. In other words, you can expect anywhere between 25 to 50 hours of post-launch content. One last feature we'll have to wait for is modding. When asked about modding, Sasko said that it's not part of their current goals, but it is part of the post-launch roadmap. And finally, one feature that's not part of any roadmap for Cyberpunk, at least on the single-player front, are microtransactions. If CDPR is to be trusted, and it's my opinion that they definitely are, everything in this game will be earned via gameplay, and I think everyone will agree that's just how it should be. And that seems like a perfect place to wrap things up. It's been a pleasure and a challenge to wrangle all the information about this massive game into one preview. But if I missed anything, please let me know in the comments. As always, if you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up and don't forget to share it with friends who might want to give it a watch. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, click the giveaway link in the description below for a chance to win one of two $100 gift cards to either Amazon, PlayStation, Nintendo, Xbox, or Steam. If you're not into giveaways, but you still want to support me, or you just want to keep up with what I'm playing, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you so much for watching the entire video. Until next time, I want to remind everyone to never stop questing.